year after year we strive to surpass the continuously growing expectations from the state level with minimal provisions. We do more with less because it matters. We purchase materials for our classrooms and students and attend staff development during the summer because it matters. But exceptional teachers are still leaving the profession or leaving our state. Students do not have adequate resources. Schools are in dire need of repair. Why? Let me share some key education and legislation facts. North Carolina teachers have not received a pay step raise since 2008, five years, which ranks us 46th in the nation regarding teacher salary. Yes, we were blessed with a 1.2% raise in 2012, but those 45 pre-tax dollars per month didn't come close to covering insurance rate increases or cost of living. Many of our dedicated professionals actually went into the negative. What might that look like in real world terms? Do I buy gas to get to and from work? Or do I buy groceries for dinner? By 2018, career status or tenure will be eliminated in North Carolina. No more due process rights for job security for quality educators. I gotta go fast. Tommy's gonna let me keep going, right? Y'all are gonna let me keep going. <laughs> No class size capacity from 4th through 12th grade. Where do you put 35 5th graders in a regular class size classroom? And how do you manage to meet those students' needs, educating them to their full potential? Funding for 3,850 teaching assistance positions was cut from the budget. These are essential staff members, and we need assistance in all K-3 classrooms. Master's degrees will no longer receive compensation after 2014. We as educators encourage students to seek higher levels of education, even though North Carolina's policies do not value that trait in their educators. How is North Carolina going to attract and retain these highly qualified, effective teachers? With legislation that appears to be slowly dismantling North Carolina's public education system, why do I continue to teach? I teach because it is my passion. I love my students, and I want to give them the support they need to be the best individuals that they can be. I believe in the power of knowledge and putting it into practice. I value collaborative communities, working together to create solutions and discover new possibilities. I educate for productive citizenship and lifelong learning. I stand up for students for our future. As you listen to this evening's speakers, take the opportunity to reflect on how North Carolina's governmental policies affect real people in real situations, and consider how these same policies affect you and your family. I invite you to take action. Contact legislators, research legislation, support causes, have conversations, Make changes. Vote for education. Thank you. Try to keep it in the place where it was. We appreciate uh, Harvest House hosting this and really appreciate and want to leave it well. Our next issue speaker is Todd Carter, Director of Development and Hospitality, House of Food. Oh, Friends, neighbors, fellow high country citizens, I'm here today to tell you that the dream lives here. The dream lives here, right here. Dr. King's dream is alive here in our beautiful North Carolina mountains. But make no mistake, it's under attack. The dream is under attack. From the State House in Raleigh to the Courthouse on King Street, they're coming for it. Your dream, my dream, our dreams of fairness, justice, and equality, and prosperity are under attack. And it's up to everybody in this room to do something about it. What are we going to do? 
we got to stand up. we got to stand up and take the dream home, not only for us, but for the nearly 14,000 Matagans. That's 26% that live in poverty. 1.7 million North Carolinians live below the federal poverty level. We must take the dream home for them. Does it surprise you that we have the third highest poverty rate in the state of North Carolina? And what does escalating poverty mean? Hungry kids. We must stand up and take the dream home for the hungry kids. We must stand up and take the dream home for the 247 employees of Gates Rubber in Ash County. Yeah. They're being laid off. And thanks to the legislative evil taking place in Raleigh, they only get $350 a week instead of the 535 they would have gotten. How can any family live on $350 a week? They can't. We must stand up and take the dream home for the 71,000 unemployed North Carolina workers who lost federal benefits on June 30th. Another 100,000 are scheduled to lose them this year because our state legislator told the federal government, nah, no thanks. Even though it's not costing us a dime, we don't want your $600 million. Let them struggle. Oh. North Carolina has the fifth highest unemployment rate in the nation. Does denying 171,000 of our citizens sound like a good, solid solution to you? No. It's godless, it's soulless policy that attacks our most vulnerable and leaves our children to starve. We must stand up and take the dream home for the 64,000 military families who will be adversely affected by the abolishment of North Carolina's earned income tax credit. In what universe is it okay to punish our military families? I'll tell you what universe. The North Carolina Legislature University thinks that's okay. We must stand up and take the dream home for the 527,000 North Carolina workers who make less than $9 an hour. Yeah. 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 We all heard about unemployment, but we have an epidemic in this state and this county of underemployment. On top of the 14,000 Watagans that live in poverty, we have another estimated 10 thousand residents that don't make a living wage. Do the math. That's 24,000 citizens out of 52,000 that struggle. That's 24,000 out of 52,000 that barely make ends meet. That's almost half of our population that needs help just to make it. We must stand up and take the dream home for the 80% of North Carolinians making under $84,000 a year, who are now burdened with an increased tax burden, while the majority of our tax cuts we're going to people making over $940,000 a year. So let me get this straight. In North Carolina, if you're a millionaire, hooray! You get a tax cut. But if you're living paycheck to paycheck, working two jobs, struggle for consistent employment, or God forbid have a kid in college, you get to pay more. I want you to do something today. When you leave here, remember this. Wherever you live, Zionville, Bethel, Cove Creek, Junaluska, Deep Gap, ASU, Boone, Ash Wilkes, Avery, or beyond. The dream lives there because it lives in you. Go back to your neighborhoods, go back to your schools, go back to your churches and families and friends and take the dream with you every single day. Live the dream, be the dream, speak the dream, and together, we're going to bring it home for all of North Carolina. in Raleigh. And it's not you and me, it's not the people. It's not the people who need the help that the government can help. Right now we've got the pleasure to take a little musical break with Todd Wright and his friends. And Todd's got an introduction to his song. 
This is on tune. We're going to play for you. Obviously, we don't have a singer, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about it. Uh, it's by Duke Ellington. It's from his Far East Suite. I'm sorry, it's not from his Far East Suite. It's from his Suite Black, Brown, and Beige. And that suite was about the life of the, the African American from slavery up through, uh, we, let's say, Heart of Renaissance. So it's entitled Come Sunday. And the lyric, I'll give you just a little bit of the lyric. It says, Lord, dear Lord above, God Almighty, God of love, look down and see my people through. Thank <laughs> you. 
by opening the conversation, by standing in our truth. In the words of Martin Luther King in his sermon on loving our enemies, he said, We must not seek to defeat or humiliate the enemy, but to win his friendship and understanding. I personally struggle with that. <laughs> As Dr. King said, a persistent civil war rages within all our lives. But together in nonviolence, perhaps we can recognize that the evil deed of the enemy neighbor, that thing which hurts us, never expresses all that he is. An element of goodness must be found, even in our worst enemy. Ours is not to demonize, but to enlighten. Thank you, Dr. King, for this day remembering and reminding us that the march is far from us. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Rio Tavro, President of Power and Boot Community Network. To talk about the environment. The word environment is a term that I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about. Environmental concerns in terms of electoral politics are often treated as being a set of niche issues that appeal primarily to people who identify as being liberal. However, as we know, the environment is about far more than just political calculations and policy making. The environment, in my mind, literally encompasses everything, both human-made and that of the natural world. It being the case that we live on one life-sustaining planet in the depths of outer space means that everything we do, make and destroy, contributes to the well-being of this environment that we live in and are a part of. The air we breathe, the water we drink, the food that we eat, the clothes that we wear, the materials we build our houses from, the gasoline that powers our cars. These things are our surroundings, our environment, just as much, if not more, as the beautiful mountains we get to enjoy here in Boone. A misleading narrative that often gets played out in the political process is that of a false choice, that we can either protect the environment or create jobs. This is a misrepresentation of not only what the environment means, but also what it means to have an economy. Redesigning and redeveloping our built environments to be more in sync with the constraints of the ecological world would inevitably create more opportunities for entrepreneurship and job creation, not less. All. Entrepreneurship is all about finding a solution to a problem or a better way of doing things <laughs> and turning it into business. Furthermore, we cannot separate the well-being of the environment and the economy because of the basic fact that we cannot build things and engage in trade unless we have a stable natural environment to exist within and to draw resources from. Simply put, we should not view protecting the environment as being burdensome to creating successful businesses, we should view it as a driver of innovation that can contribute to the creation of successful businesses. Without a doubt, there are factors at play. I'm trying to stay within the people. Without a doubt, there are factors at play in our current political system that are preventing good policies from being passed. Policies that incentivize good environmental stewardship while encouraging economic development. The fact that our state government passed a bill that effectively outlawed climate science from coastline development decision making processes is a disturbing indicator that many of our political leaders either distrust science itself or are in denial of the realities that are already unfolding as a result of climate change. The fact that our state legislature is attempting to repeal our renewable energy portfolio standard, which is by far the best in this area of the country, is another sad example of our elected officials 
failing to connect the dots between environmental friendly innovation and economic development. Which leads us here, where we are today. In light of these and many other startling actions taken by our local, state, and federal officials, it is up to us to figure out how we can set our state, our country, and our global society on a more sustainable and equitable course. I know that in my time spent as a student activist at Appalachian State, and in my recent life, in my recent life as an organizer and entrepreneur, I've come across many, many people of different ages and backgrounds that share a vision for a future that includes a healthy, healthy and safe environment for everyone. And therein lies the solution. When it comes down to it, I think most people want the same fundamental things. We want to live in relative safety, comfort, and in health. We want security in our way of life. We want and appreciate beauty and to be free to pursue what makes us happy. None of this can happen, sustainably at least, with an ecological environment that is on the brink of collapse. Contrary to conventional political wisdom, I believe that people really do deeply care about the environment. The issues just have to be put into terms that are real and relevant for them. It is through, it is through interacting and relating with others that we can connect the dots between issues of environmental sustainability, human rights, health, economic stability, and other major issues of our time. And really briefly, I would just like to make a call to action. I would encourage and invite all of you to use a new community organizing tool that was just launched that lets individuals, nonprofits, communities of faith, farmers, artists, musicians, student groups, local businesses, everyone in our community to publicize what they're doing and connect with others that share their passions, share their concerns for a better future and organize with them. It's called the Boone Community Network, and it's a community social network that hopefully can lead to more events like this, and hopefully a more activated, stimulated populace so that we can take back the power and pursue a better future. Thank you all for being our next speaker is Veronica Powell, an ESL teacher, and uh, she also works at Caldwell Community College. Thank you for being here to speak to the topic of immigration. I'm the last person that needs to get to take this on. Three weeks, three minutes, I've it. I've brought it I teach English as a second language in Boone, and the students I teach come from all over the world. They're, they're remarkably resilient and courageous people. And they share their stories with me, which help me appreciate that no matter how bad it gets here, it's a lot worse most other places. One former student was a young woman who had to flee for fun before soldiers came. The same soldiers who burned down her grandmother's village, systematically raping the women. Soldiers want the land for the valuable conflict minerals used in cell phones and laptops. My student managed to escape after a relative picked her up 30 miles from the village she had to run away from. She moved to the city got a university degree and then came here. She plans to become a doctor and return to Africa to help women like her grandmother. Another student, <laughs> another student came to Boone to join his father. He was a skilled engineer but had to seek political asylum here after a military coup. He worked for 10 years making sushi every day except for Christmas in order to bring his wife and daughter to Boone. When I met his daughter, she was 20. She hadn't seen her father since she was 10 years old. And you've probably eaten sushi. Some of my students live in fear, afraid to come to English class because their driver's license has expired. They are mothers with young children who worry about being detained or deported and what might happen to their kids, many of whom were born here and are citizens. At present, certain North Carolina representatives are targeting immigrants, in particular with two bills one, HB 786, will allow policemen to verify citizenship of anyone they stop for a violation if they have reasonable suspicion that person may be undocumented. The bill proposes that people without proof of citizenship may be detained and their car confiscated. If it passes, all of us will need to carry passports or other documentation with us wherever we go. A second bill, number 218, 
would prevent undocumented young people from attending institutions of higher education. Already they are at a disadvantage because they have to pay out-of-state tuition, and who can afford that? Immigration is opportunity for everybody. It strengthens the economy and allows the talented, ambitious people to contribute to this country. Democracy is an opportunity. I tell my students that democracy is a process. And even though it may not seem so at this particular moment, we are getting better at it. When our civil liberties and fundamental human rights are threatened, as they have been in the past, are now, and will be again, this is another opportunity, an opportunity to rise up and defend our nation's most basic premise that all people, even immigrants, are created equal. Defending that principle brings out the best in all of us. We are not done yet. Democracy is a process. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. We've had excellent speakers on the issue. Let's give these folks another round of applause. Thank you. Again, if you're interested in the numbers, be sure you get the fact sheet, the numbers fact sheet, uh, put together by the NAACP, North Carolina NAACP. It has great information to share, or you can contact these speakers and get more information from them. It's now my uh, honor to introduce Kat Chapin to share some music with us. Good afternoon. Wow. But mm, truly inspiring to see everybody here. It's so good to see so many faces come out with such a good cause. A uh, little song here by Sam Cook, Cheney Stone Cone. Every widow. <laughs> Oh, 
Yes, it will. Thank you, Pat. Tom McDonough next to recognize the rest of you. All work together. We can do better than that. All work together. I'm honored today. Very honored to be able to recognize some folks and be a part of them. How many of you here attended any of the rallies on Monday uh, in Raleigh? Raise your hand up. Very good. They were really inspiring. Every week they got bigger and more people came and were louder. There were a lot of people there, especially the women when the motorcycle bill passed. I didn't want to be in front of them. I tell you. This group of people behind me is a very special group. They've been called many things, believe me. From our illustrious governor calling them outsiders and agitators, to one of our illustrious legislatures who called them moral Monday morons. Believe me, they are not that. These people made a decision during some point in the Moral Monday. They wanted to go further than they had gone with their voices and their signs. And so they made a decision. They made a decision to practice civil disobedience. <laughs> They wanted to exercise their constitutional rights, both federal and state, to petition their legislature, their elected officials, concerning actions that were detrimental to the citizens of North Carolina. After they had made the decision, there was no pressure on them whatsoever. They met at a church prior to the Moral Monday gathering of that particular week, for all 13 weeks. And we were taken to a church where we heard Dr. Barber talk to us about the ideals of the movement, the ideals of disobedience and nonviolence. We heard wonderful sermons, believe me. They were great. They informed us of our accountability and our responsibilities and also the consequences of our actions. We then proceeded after a short snack, we proceeded to the rally area on buses or any way that we could get there. After we heard more good speeches, we formed for procession into the General Assembly building. It was quite moving, and I think everybody will agree with me, to see the thousands of people part with a pathway down to the General Assembly. Several of us in several of the uh, processions were very honored to have the Veterans for Peace organization lead us in with a color guard, and we love that. Being able to see the people on each side of the path reach out, touch us, give us high fives, all of those wonderful things, our prayers, their prayers, we proceeded into the General Assembly building and were welcomed by the guards. <laughs> Sheep led the slaughter. <laughs> we gathered down in the rotunda down and below, and again, Reverend Barber led us not only in prayers, but he led us in uh, cheers, and we had people singing, we had people that gave testimony to what the issues were, just as you've heard a little today. And then, out of the blue, came the, uh, the foghorn 
that told us that either we leave or we would be arrested. Uh, it was easy to see who was going to stay because we wore green armbands. And the patrol and everyone else was very kind to only pick on those people. <laughs> Mr. Weaver came to each of us after the call had been cleared and asked us to leave personally. And he told us what would happen if we didn't. Of course, no one left. And so they lined us up. They lined us up and a peace officer of some sort, either state patrol, capital police, or uh, Raleigh police, came up and handcuffed us. You didn't get a choice whether it was in front or in back. They then took us down and processed us very basically the same way. Uh, some of them were fingerprinted, some, uh, most of all of us were uh, uh, photographed with a mug shot, and we had our valuables taken away from us, and we were sat down on seats and sat there for it seemed like hours. We then were loaded on a bus, men on one bus, women on the other, so there was no, you know, presentation of any kind with our hands behind us. <laughs> and as we left, we had to pass through the crowds, and I think, again, that was quite stirring to see the people singing and cheering and going on through. <laughs> we had a guided tour of Raleigh. We got to see a lot of streets. And they finally took us, and we ended up uh, in our vehicles at the Wake County uh, Detention Center, a beautiful new structure that uh, many schools wish they had had as many nice facilities as they had. We were taken in to the detention center. You know, you've seen it on TV where they back up to the door and open up this big door and we come out. Uh, we were taken in to the detention center and divided into detention cells. Eight of us to a cell. Now, that's not too bad, except we were warned before we left that each cell got to flush the toilet only twice. <laughs> so we had to, you know, stay there. <laughs> My group was finally let out. The handcuffs were taken off. And we were chained together with handcuffs, eight of us together, and taken on a tour of the detention facility. We finally got to a room where they let us out. They uncuffed us, sat us down, and we waited again. We were at that time able to see some of the things that happened to those less fortunate than ourselves as they were being processed and booked. And then, we were finally taken before the magistrate, or rather five magistrates at the time, and everybody got through that except me. I had a hat on and I got scolded for that, so I had to take it off. But we met with our magistrates and uh, they assigned us a hearing date. We were also warned we could not go back to the Capitol, rather to the uh, General Assembly until after our trial. We finally were released, walked outside, and there was this wonderful reception of people from churches, uh, legislatures who are friendly to the cause, and friends who picked us up and took us back to a church of, uh, where we had originally gathered and were given a wonderful supper. While we were waiting out there, we did meet with our legal representatives, and they told us what was in store. We do not talk much about what's in store for us because we don't know. But if you can imagine what almost a thousand people do when they plead not guilty, you can understand you should have some sympathy for what I want to call off the names and I hope the people will raise their hand high so you can see them and recognize them and will be recognized as a group after that. 
Gene Brooks. <laughs> Craig Weaver. <laughs> Dylan Brady. <laughs> Beth Davidson. Pete <laughs> Hopkins. <laughs> Ralph McCoy. Cindy McKenna. Again. Katie Wilson. Felicia Peterson. Mike Hopsdale. Emory Stewart, Gene McAllister, Betsy and John Barrow, and Gay, Sa uh, Gay Saber. Let's give all of them a hand. To make and time to make these events happen and the continuing more one day movement. Donation buckets that look like this and pledge card buckets that look like this are only blue are available in the lobby area. And as you depart after the rally, be sure you put whatever funding in the red ones, cards, commitments in the blue ones. I'll speak to the cards and commitments in just a few minutes. It's our pleasure again to bring on Todd Wright and friends for some more wonderful, wonderful music. Thank you so much. This next composition is Lord. It's written by North Carolinian John Coltrane, so you may know him. In the mid-60s, John Coltrane was very, very aware of the civil rights struggle. And from time to time, he communicated with Dr. King. In fact, the inspiration for some of his compositions comes from Dr. King's speeches. This one is entitled Dear Lord.
people in Asheville we got to meet. I think about 10,000 of them. Yeah. So, so said the police, I've learned something uh, about mountain folks. Do not mess with mountain folks. <laughs> I'm really here because of my mama. Sometimes I look at the governor and Speaker Tillis and Speaker Pro Tem Berger and Old Paul Stam over there, and I sort of wonder, do y'all have no mama? <laughs> Does your mama know what you're doing? Can you go home? I don't know. But my mama has given most of her life and all of her energy to uh, the fourth grade in the North Carolina Public Schools, 40 years in the fourth grade. Forty years. That, that's even longer than Governor McCord has spent in the fourth grade. See? And I remember her going early and staying late 
and knowing what was going on in homes and how that affected the children in her classroom and how she tried to mend up folks and so they could get a little learning done. She's still uh, tutoring uh, people on the side though she retired. The, uh, what I, the strongest memory I have of her as a professional, and she was a serious professional, is her station wagon when we would, my father's a Methodist preacher, and you know the bishop would say it's time to move, and we'd say it's time to move, and we would go down in her station wagon to the school and then load up her stuff. And it, it was her teaching stuff. She had, and there were all, there was about three station wagons full of it. Because, you know, with all that big money she was nailing down, teaching the fourth grade, she bought her own stuff, her own supplies for the children, when, you know, so that they didn't run out of the things they needed, books that she thought were better, all of her bullet, you know, bulletin board stuff. You know, it was very, her profession was much more important to her than her income, though we were not wealthy by any means. And I, I, uh, I think about that. One thing I wanted to mention that doesn't get said very often, which is, you know, my, my mother is the brains of my family. I mean, my father and I are kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> we like to think anyway. We laugh at our own jokes anyway. But, uh, and, but my mother, in terms of the gray matter in my family is way above anybody else. Everybody knows it. The thing is about our public schools, we've had an artificial subsidy because of course in her generation the professions that were open to her were not so many. Very few women of her generation went to medical school. A handful. Very few went to law school. Many places didn't admit them to professional programs. And so, if you wanted to be an independent career woman, and you were smart and strong, many people taught school. Well, so we got teachers better than we deserved. <laughs> and we didn't pay them. And we just kind of got used to that. And now we wonder, you know, why are teachers leaving the teaching profession? Well, because they don't have to stay. You know, and if you push women who are that smart, they might just find something else to do. And I think it's something we really need to think about. It was the oppression that was built into our society that gave us, in that, histories like this, the irony of that. The oppression built into our society gave us better schools. You know, it's just crazy. But I don't, I don't believe in public education so passionately because I'm such a liberal. I actually believe in public education so passionately because I'm a conservative enough theologian and a conservative enough historian to know what human beings are capable of when they don't get a good education, and when they don't get an adequate job, and when they see no future and no place for themselves in their society. These pools of misery all over the world are dangerous places where, you know, we don't know exactly what causes the kinds of things I'm talking about. You know, the road from, from the stable in Bethlehem to the Hotel Rwanda it's not as long as we wish it was. We don't know what happens to make societies crack apart and those horrors happen. But they happen consistently. Our, our species is one hell of a thing. You know, we go from poetry and symphonies to genocidal slaughter. And we keep at it. They were so beautiful and so painful. And I don't, we don't really know what causes that all together, but we know that ignorance and want are on the list. And so I just say, it's a pretty ignorant uh, approach to history. 
to, to uh, think about destroying the public schools. And make no mistake about it, they intend to destroy the public schools. They want to pay people to leave. They're taking our tax money and giving it to private institutions. If that, that's the way it's going to go. If they have their way, then the public schools will dwindle down until it's just the most desperately poor in the public schools. You might as well put a fence around it now and just call it prison. Because that's what happens. You know, and that's, and that's what they think of as a, as a plan. I don't understand that myself. You know, somebody was asking uh, uh, Speaker Pro Tem Berger a few weeks ago, what about this? You know, they gave the whole litany, increasing, increasing class size and cutting the budget so much and firing all these teachers and firing all these teachers' aides. And his response was, the schools are still open. <laughs> Gee, thanks. <laughs> the Ford Together movement is, is uh, really more about spiritual matters in some ways than it is about politics. That's the funny thing about it. My, uh, the bishops of the Presbyterian, Roman Catholic, Episcopal, Evangelical, Lutheran, Methodist, all, basically all the major denominations in the state, the denominational leadership has endorsed uh, our movement and our methods and yeah. say they do so as a matter of faith with respect to our understanding of the big biblical teachings and imperatives to protect the poor, respect the stranger, care for widows and children, and love our neighbors. I think they're getting better bishops than they used to when I was growing up. We didn't care for them too much since they made us move. The, uh, uh, so, my, I, I kind of keep insisting that Moral Monday is just a church that meets on Mondays. <laughs> I've been trying to get Reverend Dr. Barber to uh, agree to rename it the Free Will Agnostic, Free Millennial, Southern Catholic, Atheist, ACC Basketball, <laughs> Evangelical Presbyterian, Banana Pudding, Methodist Jewish Corn Liquor, Episcopal Church. <laughs> Did I say Episcopal Church? I meant Episcopal Church South. <laughs> Some of y'all know what that means. But it is too about politics. And I'll tell you why. Because we know that love is not just something you feel. You know, love is something you do. Martin Luther King's last book was called Strength to Love. It takes strength to love. He explained that uh, love, that uh, power without love is bankrupt. And, but love without power is empty and sentimental. I thought I'd close by telling you uh, one, don't despair. Do not despair. People, I know people are emailing you and calling you, and they're saying, you know, they're, they're giving you their condolences. I'm getting a lot of this. People all over the country, my old friends, stuff. sorry about what's happening in North Carolina. I say, don't be sorry about what's happening in North Carolina. We're moving. We haven't, we haven't done this in a long time. Since we started doing this, the governor's polls have dropped 26 points.
Sure. Sure. Most deadly poles are like, you know, lower the cotton mouth out in the drainage ditch. <laughs> so they're kind of on the same moral level too. But <laughs> I wanted, when I was, I wanted to close by suggesting kind of a model for what we're doing. You know, my 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 grandmama when I was growing up, my mama's mama. I always thought she was rich, like riches of air of all shapes. Because in her basement, she had, say, like 10 cases of Coca Cola, you know, and Tab and Sprite, but mostly those little seven ounce Coca Colas. God, we love them. But, and she had cases, I thought, well, if I was rich, that's what I'd have 10 cases of Coca Cola. You know? But now I know she wasn't rich. But now I know she was rich. Because she had a house full of homemade quilts. Everybody's got a house full of homemade quilts. It's rich. Because you don't, this is what we're doing. You don't make them by yourself. You make them with other folks. They're made of the odds and ends of your necessity. They're made of some polyester and some corduroy. Some denim <laughs> and some linen. They're made of, of the stuff that you've got. We are so rich in what we really do have. Our culture it has everything in it we need to do what needs doing. We've just got to get together. And it's something you don't do. You don't, do, you don't quilt in the middle of, the, of a cold winter night. Because you get together well before that. Right? And stitch these things. And together we make something beautiful and useful and precious that we'll always have that will keep our children warm and our children's children warm and maybe our children's children's children warm. I don't know where, frankly, Grandmama got all this quilt. Some of them are quite, quite old. But here in the dog days of August, I think it's important for us to start stitching our patches and bringing them together. We've never done this. We have never done this. Everybody's like, well, this doesn't happen since the 60s. What, what's happening with this movement is what the people in the 60s wish was happening. So let's, let's make a quip. One more speech and then go prayer and then some good old singing we're going to do together. This is go around. Go around. We need your energy. We need your action. We need you to go from this place. Make sure you pick up a pledge card. Make sure you drop a little in the donation. Make sure you tell 25 to 50 friends they have got to register to vote. And then you got to make sure that they register to vote. Our next speaker, closing speaker, is West. Brother Wesley Morris from the Beloved Community Center in Greensboro. We're highly honored to welcome Brother Wesley Terrell Morris to Boone. Brother Wesley is currently, as I said, at the Beloved Community Center, a social justice organization there in Greensboro. He received an undergraduate degree in professional history from North Carolina A&T State University. Brother Wesley was born in Raleigh, North Carolina. His current focus of work at the Beloved Community Center includes immigration and worker justice and youth organizing. He is a dedicated mentor, facilitator, and reconciler, actively working to build better relationships among the races, especially African American and Latino unity. He has also worked closely with the Farm Labor, Labor Organizing Committee as a human rights advocate for farm workers in North Carolina. Once again, boom, high country. Welcome, Brother Wesley.
I ride from Greenboro all the way up here. My lineage and my ancestry trickles down to the towns of Georgia, low country. <laughs> Yet that did not stop me from coming on up here to visit you all. And I felt so welcome when I got here. And I can't tell you about the kind of power that it actually takes for that to happen. Across our state, I have been able to see new relationships being built. I have actually been able to see new bridges being built. And I have actually seen people stand up for their rights. I have seen political education grow. I have seen people start to understand what it means to actually have your voting rights and actually to have a voting booth on your campus. Because you see, my generation, some of the things which were fought for, we never experienced the struggle to get there. So now we are actually becoming wise of this situation. So I just want to be here today to say, more Monday movement is working. We're moving forward together. I want to say, particularly when I came here, I was welcomed at the voter registration table by a woman named Faith who was faithfully <laughs> bringing everyone in and she actually helped me make a sign. And my sign says forward together and not one step back. You see, that was a powerful moment to me. Also, I asked a brother named Tim, I don't know where he is, but I asked Tim, I said, I need you to use the restroom and I got an unexpected tour of this facility. <laughs> As we mazed and walked our way all the way around and, and when we actually found the restroom, I said, thank you, Tim. <laughs> And then I was welcomed by a woman named Miss Kate. And she said, you know, I read about you online, so I'm looking forward to hearing from you. So I said, well, thank you. But I can't say enough about this one person that I didn't meet today, whom I had a conversation with just out there in the hall. She didn't know that I was going to be a speaker, and pretty sure she didn't know I was going to say her name. But there was a young lady here, her name was Heather. And I had this whole thing written up, and I had it together, and I wanted to but Heather just changed my mind a little bit. She told me that she came because someone came and spoke to her classroom. There are so many people that are doing this work and that it is invested in and that care so deeply that may not be seen, they may not have a program, they might not have a chair roped off, but I want to thank you right now and I want to thank them for doing the work of building the beloved community here. Building it here. In books, or is being built in philosophy, or being built in theory. But when it gets built here, something begins to change. Something begins to transform. And I want to encourage each and every one of us, as Heather encouraged me, to continue to prepare ourselves for struggle. Struggle breeds life. Struggle encourages life. Matter of fact, struggle is the essence or the seed of transformation. I saw a lot of butterflies on my way up here, and I don't mean to be so sentimental about it, but I love butterflies. Yeah. <laughs> to me, they really represent what the Moral Monday movement is about. They seem to have some kind of moral high ground, other than other insects. They seem to be so beautiful in what we achieve or what we strive to be like. We want to be that transformed butterfly. But sometimes we have to recognize our cocoon state. And we have to work out of that cocoon. And we have to appreciate the strength that is gained when we are coming out of our cocoon. So when we gathered in Raleigh, because of the policies and the house bills that were cutting education, that were coming after Medicare, which affects my family, when they cut unemployment, that affects my friends, who are not lazy, who are not, not trying to find work. There are just no positions. And in the meantime, it would help for them to be supplemented by something that they paid into. Am I right? I don't know. When you come into those things, we as a people, we the people, have to do something for each other. And something that's represented in this room, as I stand here, is this beautiful convergence of destiny, history, and memory. And the way in which we are creating a memory right now, I won't forget this moment, I promise you. 
I hope some of you never forget this moment. Because right now we're living off the memories that have served us to this point in time. The passions that were engaged in that march 50 years ago are still stirring us at this moment right now. So whatever collective memory we infuse into this moment, may it rest and abide in this space and flow out of the walls and flow out of the windows and find rest in the hearts and in the minds of our friends in the hearts and the minds of our neighbors whom we may have been a little bit scared to talk to before. May you be encouraged by that memory. And may we understand that history is not caught up in a book, but history is wrought out in our hands as we are sitting here, clapping. They're wrought out in our feet as we march. And they're wrought out in the passion that encapsulates itself in your heart. Because I heard some musicians today that sang out of their heart. I heard some speakers speak today about issues that are from their heart. This is history in motion. This is live history right in front of us. And the last piece of destiny. Destiny is something that's often talked about in a personal sense, like, what is my destiny? What is my destiny on this earth? What is my purpose? What is my meaning? But today I want to say that destiny is a collective ideal that is only realized when we as individuals have collective meetings, when we have collective marches. We have collective stances, and we do collective work for the common good. And I want to say our destiny is right before us in this room. I have a dear friend that says whatever question you have, whether it's personal, private, or community, the answer for it is in the room. The answer for it is in the room. We heard about the environment. We heard about education. We heard about the void of ethics and morality that is inhabited the General Assembly for some time now. I did say all that. Wow. Void of, void of ethics and morality. But we as a people, if we are able to continue in this ethical movement, this progressive and moral movement, we will set the example for the new day in which we are to have. So we don't need to change where we're going. We just need to keep moving forward. I want to do one more thing and it just popped in my mind. If everyone in here, if you don't mind standing up, and this is for my mother, if you can, stand, because I know I don't want to call you if you don't feel like standing. We all travel a long ways, and I had to put on an ankle brace just to get here. I know other people put on knee braces, and I see some crutches, but we all made it. We're here in the building. This is something that's just on my heart to do. I do it sometimes, but if everyone could just do two motions with me, could you just put your hand out in front of yourself right here? This is so beautiful. I hope there's a photographer that's able to get this. Uh, just put them out. And then this next motion is just turn to your neighbor and say hello. But you got to keep your hands out in front of yourself. So there might be some touching. And, you know, just say hello. Just, you know, a, beautiful, a beautiful thing happened. This is the last piece of keep your hand out in front of you just for this one last move. I saw a lot of strong people in here, so this last move might be difficult, so be gentle. I saw a couple of you that looked like you were bench pressing a little bit, or maybe you were actually doing a little work out there on the farm this morning. I, I, I just want you to all to be careful on this last move. This is what my mother instructs me many times when I get off the phone. She says, Wesley, before you go to sleep and you go off to your dreams, Give yourself a hug. So just give yourself a hug because this is a love movement. And oftentimes we forget what's in the room and we forget to love ourselves so that we can truly love others. I did, could not feel the love from you all if you didn't love yourself as a community. Our families can't feel our love until we love ourselves. So love each and every one of you. And I want to end this by saying forward together.
Thank you. Yeah, and now putting this together, Jerry McCombs kept coming up the mountain to work with the organizing committee, and he asked for a few seconds to say a few words. I want to say, first, I represent the State of North Carolina Conference, NAACP. I'm the district director, and uh, Boone happens to be my area. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Can we get Tom a hand? <laughs> the other person that worked real strong with this committee was Marge. Ms. Marge, would you raise your hand for Marge and Marge? <laughs> now, there is some the committee people that are not here also. Committee people, would you raise your hand if they have one of the committee people? Give me a hand. Give me a hand. I actually do the one more thing. I would love to come back and do history for Boone. I think it's going to be history. If we can come back and organize a branch in Boone, North Carolina. Amen? <laughs> the, 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 membership, the membership is $30 a year. Life membership is $750. I would be more than glad to come back and meet with a group of you, get, get the branch started. And we get this branch started, I can guarantee you. I'll be done a barber prayer to speak. Is that all right? Yeah. So thank you so much for coming up. Hope you have a beautiful job. Thank you so much. And remember, forward together. Not one step back. Remember, we have a role to play as we leave this place today. Voter registration may be one of the most important things we can all do. Pledge cards, leave the little yellow pledge cards. Pledge to register 25 to 50 new voters early this fall. This rally is a call to continuing action. It doesn't stop here, it keeps on going. Thanks for everyone to come. Thanks for those who joined us on live stream. Thanks to the organizers and presenters. This is not the last time we'll all gather together. We've got a movement going and we're gonna keep it going. Taking the dream back home, forward together, not one step back, not one step back, forward together, not one step back. Melanie Children's going to come up and give us the benediction. Friends, we are with the universe, the arc of the universe does bend toward justice, but that arc stretches out into a seemingly eternal horizon at times. The dream has not yet fully become reality, which reminds me of a profound quote from the central text of rabbinic Judaism called The Talent, and it says, Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. to go from this place. Let us join our hearts and the diverse beliefs that sustain us separately in a moment of communal reflection and hope. Would you stand as you are able for our closing benediction? God of justice, may we go forward from this place together, inspired and emboldened to speak the truth to our neighbors, to speak truth to power, to speak the truth in love. Grant us courage that we may go forward together from this place in peace and hope and fierce determination that justice will flow like waters and that we will indeed bring the dream home. May we bring that dream home so that all will eat from a table of plenty and sleep in safe shelter. May we bring the dream home so that everyone will have access to physical and mental health resources. May we bring the dream home so that all people will be able to vote their conscience without fear or obstruction. May we bring the dream home so that our education system will provide adequately for our children's formation. May we bring the dream home so that a woman will be granted the same control over her body that a man has always enjoyed over his. May we bring the dream home so that every individual will be able to marry the one she or he loves. May we bring the dream home so that Democrat, Republican, rich, poor, black, white, Latino, straight, gay, immigrant, native peoples, privileged and powerless, will no longer be markers that divide. And so God, may we bring this dream home. 
that there will no longer ever be an us and a them, but only and finally a blessed we. Amen. 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 We're going to be closed down with some wonderful music. Y'all know the song. Sing along. Grab a hand. Remain standing. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim.
when everything is falling apart. Oh, and life hasn't love. You know I need to remember there's such a thing as trying too hard. You got to say like you don't need the money, love. Like you'll never get hurt. You got to dance. Like nobody's watching It's gotta come from the heart If you want it to work You got to sing sometimes Like you don't need the money Love sometimes Like you'll never get hurt You got to dance, dance, dance Like nobody's watching It's gotta come from the heart If you want it to work